Hello, my name's Louisa. I've been a member of Regia for about 14 years. And one of my favourite things is the textiles. It's estimated, for those who've looked into this extensively, that perhaps up to half of Viking women's working hours would have been spent preparing textiles for the family. Funnily enough, the winters in Norway and the rest of Scandinavia are jolly cold and if you don't have some nice warm clothes it's going to end very very badly for you. Now the primary fabric was wool. I've got some examples here. This is fleece from a primitive breed sheep akin to what the Vikings would have had. This is from a Shetland. Now Shetlands and other primitive breeds have two coats, an outer hairy coat and an inner softer warm coat. Unlike modern breeds such as Merino, they don't need to be shorn because their wool all rises at the same time every spring. They can be what's known as rude. Literally you just pluck the wool off in one great big lump. Much easier. After that, first you have to pick off all the uh, less pleasant parts of the fleece, like the dags, the bit around the sheep's rear end, and pick out things like twigs, straw, other vegetable matter. Then you'd give everything a good wash, and at that point you can start the process of preparing it for spinning. In order to spin, you've got to make sure the fibres are all neat, tidy and aligned. And we do that with a pair of wool combs. You can still buy combs similar in style to this for modern spinning. They're known as English wool combs. But similar ones to this may have been used all across Northern Europe and possibly further as well. And literally you just comb everything nice and neatly till it's all tidily lined up and all the snarls have been dealt with. Kind of like brushing your hair every morning. As you can imagine this is the kind of time-consuming chore that gets much more pleasant when you're sitting around with a bunch of mates having a chat and or as they would have done you can rope in the kids. <laughs> Call it a game and you can probably keep them quiet for all of about 15 minutes. Now I've got the uh, all the scrappy bits dealt with. We'll draw off the nicely aligned stuff and start spinning. The next step, once you've got through the time-consuming process of preparing the fleece, is the almost as time-consuming process of actually spinning it into a yarn. And they would have used drop spindles, which is basically a stick with a weight on it. And those weights or walls could have been used, made of pretty much anything wood, stone, metal, bone, glass, anything that will hold a little bit of the momentum. Because once you start this spinning, in order to twist your yarn, you don't want it to stop unexpectedly on you. Yes. You can see why they're called drop spindles. No more Get this there. wrong. Thank you and you're quite likely to drop it on the ground. In fact, I'm pretty sure that dropping it on the ground is an integral part of learning how to spin. If you haven't dropped your spindle, are you even a spinner? As you can imagine, this takes a while. And every adult most likely would have known how to spin. You would have started at a young age, and by the time you got to adulthood, you would have been rather good at it. This would have been considered quite a thick and lumpy thread by their standards. I've not been doing it long enough. I think it's time to move on to something more exciting. Well, once you've made your thread and spent a very, very long time at it, no doubt. Well, as nice as a freshly done ball of yarn is. Frankly, it's not the most exciting of colours. 
sheep come in various shades. But there's a bit of a similarity in all of these. There's a bit of a theme going on. The Vikings loved colour. All colour. Any colour. Pre preferably worn with every other colour they liked. Taste is a modern concept. It arrives in the Georgian period. Given half a chance, the Vikings could be absolute eyesores. Now, in order to get those colours, you have to dye your, your thread or your fabric. It's easier to dye thread, because you can do it in smaller batches, but you do run the risk of getting several batches all subtly different shades. Modern times hasn't got rid of that. They still say if you're going to do a big knitting or crochet project, make sure you buy enough yarn at the same time so you don't end up with two different dye batches. Now, some plants were fairly easy to get hold of and use. These yellows and greens came from a plant called Weld, which loves growing on building sites. It's about five foot tall with bright yellow flowers on, and it gives the most horrific shades of yellow. Depending on where you are in the British Isles, somewhere between 75 and 90% of plants will give you some shade of yellow or green. As such, these colours would have been fairly commonly seen. They come in all manner of mustardy shades as well. It's also fairly easy to make shades of dusty brown. These come from onion skins. They will fade eventually, but they're quite good fun and they use things that you'd otherwise throw out. The next colour I've got examples of here is shades of red, pink and orange. And they came from the roots of a plant called madder, which is related to sticky grass, cleavers. Sticky willy, goosegrass, call it what you will. The roots would be dug up, dried, chopped, chucked in hot water to extract dye molecules. And depending on how strong a dye bath you use, what the pH of that dye bath is, yep, madder is sensors from acids and alkalis, you can get a lovely range of colours. Rather, rather beautiful burgundy shades. These would be posh. Through oranges, browns, and right down to a shade of delicate pinks. Vikings seem to have been particularly fond of imported madder from places, and until the invention of the modern Alizarin synthesis, places like the Netherlands exported large quantities of madder. It grows very well in sandy soil. However, the minute synthetic alizarin became cheaply available, the madder industry collapsed more or less overnight. Also got here a sample of blue. Blue comes from a plant called woad, which is related to indigo and is actually the same chemical we use to dye our jeans. It is a somewhat long, involved, and frankly not very nice process. First you take your woad leaves and you stir them into a bucket of stale urine and squeeze them around to get all the juices out. Then you would put the lid on, very tightly, and put it somewhere warm somewhere like near the fire, the fire you would cook over, the fire you would eat near, the fire you would huddle up to when it was cold, that fire, and you'd leave it there for about six to eight weeks. And after about six to eight weeks, you would take that bucket with its lid still tightly fitted a very long way away, because frankly if you don't everybody will go a long way away from you, and you hold your nose and you take the lid off and draw out the fabric or the yarn. And at first you can't even tell that anything's changed. It'll have gone in, cream or whatever colour the sheep was, and it first comes out a kind of creamy yellow. But as you wave it through the air, left to right, not front to back or you will have no friends ever, trust me, it reeks. As the oxygen gets to it, you undergo a chemical reaction and that creamy yellow starts to go to a brassy yellow shade 
and fades through green to various shades of blue. And if you're lucky, it might come out a fairly strong blue. If you're unlucky, it'll come out quite a pale blue. And in order to get darker shades, you have to do it again, and again, and again. If you're really unlucky, it won't have worked at all. And your six to eight weeks of stale, stinking urine will have been for naught. Also, you could get greens. Some quite nice greens as opposed to the boring mossy ones. Uh, so we've got an example of here. And these greens you would get by taking your woad blue and over dyeing it with yellow. Uh, as beautiful as blue was, as prized, anything that takes that much time and effort was expensive. It does have a drawback. Rather like an old tweed jacket, if you're wearing woad blue and you get rained on, you will still smell faintly of blue. So, you've got your thread, you've dyed it pretty colours. Great, now what? You're still naked. Not good in a Norwegian winter. The next step is weaving it. Now, in order to make a large sheet of fabric that you could then cut and sew. They would use what's known as a warp weighted or vertical loom, where upon, which is where the warp threads, the ones that go up and down, are suspended from a beam with weights at the bottom. And that holds everything under tension and you then insert your weft threads. They go from left to right or weft to right, that's how you remember them. And beat that into place. Beautiful. It takes an age, but you do eventually get fabric, and you then treat it very, very carefully because you know exactly how long it took. Okay, great. We've got fabric, and sometimes it comes in beautiful patterns like this, or other times it's all one colour. Got your fabric, you cut and sew, and you think, great, lovely. I'd like some decoration on that. And that's where the tablet loom comes in. Now, the tablet loom's a fairly simple piece of equipment. It's basically two uprights held in place with horizontal bars so that you can put tension on some warp threads. These warp threads, as you can see, are threaded through holes in cards or tablets, which is where it gets its name. And while some of them have all the same colours, some of these tablets have different colours through different holes. By turning the tablets, you can control which colours show on the front of the, on the top of the band. Turn the tablets, change the colours, pass the weft, and if you do this quite a lot, patterns emerge. So, and if you want to do very, very fancy ones, you can even add things like metallic threads. And these narrow bands would be applied to clothing, faces like the top of a hangarok, round the cuffs and collars of a tunic. 